Bishop is a PhD chemist and professional science enthusiast. He doesn't actually get paid for that part, but he's <laughs> professional anyway. Uh, when not pu pushing the boundaries of knowledge in his research as a postdoctoral fellow at UW Madison, he's trying to come up with simple explanations for a complex universe for his blog, Science Minus Details. Lee loves to pee. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Is everyone, can everyone hear me in back? Are we cool? Yeah. 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 Well, we're not cool. Gonna, yeah. <laughs> Are we nerds? <laughs> so, all right. So, as Alina said, I'm a chemist, so there will be chemical structures in this talk. Don't be freaked out. There will be no test. Um, so, this is P. And so, as a, you know, I have peed all of my life. And as a, you know, as a chemist, I began to, you know, I realized I didn't know really much about pee. I knew that there was urea in it, and I knew it was water, blah, blah, blah. But I had you know, a couple of, of like fundamental questions about it. Uh, some of the, the main questions were, why is pee yellow, and why does it smell? And so I began to investigate those questions, and then that led me to another, a, a number of like amazing discoveries, a few of which I'm going to share <laughs> with you this evening. So here's the, pee, uh, the composition of pee. We can see that pee is 95% water, and so that is fact to remember number one for the end of the talk. P contains water. Do not forget this. Is there a test? There, there's no test, but it'll be very helpful if you remember it. So then, so there's like the other, like pretty much 5% right here. And we're look, as a chemist, I'm looking for something that is yellow. And I can tell you that none of these things are yellow. So this is like, you know, WTF, what is it in P that makes P yellow? And believe it or not, the thing that is in P that makes P yellow our pee is yellow because our blood is red, which is pretty cool. So our body is able to take our red blood and make yellow pee. And so, so our blood is actually red because of this, this uh, it's, not a, it's a, like a protein called hemoglobin. Uh, and hemoglobin is red because of this guy, which is heme. And you can see all the alternating single and double bonds there, and the iron atom in the center, and those, are, those two things go together. It makes it absorb visible light, and that's why it's red. And so our body takes that and, and keeps the iron, breaks open this, this ring right there, and then gives you this different chemical, which has more you know, alternating double and single bonds, which will be highlighted in blue this evening. And it absorbs visible light, and it's yellow. And so that's why your pee is yellow. And so what if your pee is really yellow? Um, so that could be due to a number of things, one of which is you are sleeping all night and you are not peeing, hopefully. Um, and then and your body was breaking down blood cells and then, um, and, and then you have to spit out the urobilin in the morning. Um, another reason is, is you're taking vitamins. And the, vitam the culprits uh, for that uh, intense yellow color are vitamins B2 and B12. You can see all the uh, alternating single and double bonds there. And then the metal, those make... Uh, these, these chemicals yellow. So, um, and there's, you can, your pee can be an insane variety of colors. It can be this crazy orange color um, due to a number of different drugs. This one is a, a urinary tract local analgesic, so you pee it out and it kind of numbs your whole urinary tract. Um, and then it can also be purple. This one is, this one is really cool. Um, so this actually, this is due to a bacterial infection in your urinary tract. Uh, taking these two molecules, it couples them together to make a, a chemical called indigo. You may have heard of indigo. Indigo is a super famous uh, molecule. It was one of the first dyes ever synthesized by human beings in 7th century BC. And it can sometimes happen in your body, which is pretty mind melting. So uh, your pee can also be green if you take a drug such as, uh, such as methylene blue. Uh, and you take these, these types of things uh, for treatment of malaria and all sorts of other things. Um, you may say blue. Well, this P, this P is green. I'm, I'm no dummy. Uh, but don't forget the color wheel. Blue plus yellow equals green. So, yeah. So, so now we know a lot about what, um, what causes the color of P. The next question is, why does P smell? Right. And so here's, here I am doing an experiment. Proper laboratory safety always, even at home. Yeah. Um, so the the thing about this is, the thing about this is when uh, when you're when you're trying to smell something, it, you're not smelling every single molecule, every single type of molecule that's in there. It's only the molecules that can make it out of the pee into the air and then from the air into your nose. And so this is the same. This is um, yeah. So 
This is similar to when, when someone farts, right? Hopefully the fart is all gas, right, usually. Um, and then it will make it, uh, so all of the gas molecules are mixed well with the air and then they go into your nose. And you, so when you, when you smell someone's fart, actually a molecule that were in their butt are now in your nose. That's kind of how, kind of how it works here. So, um, so, yeah, where was I here? So this, um, so we're looking for we're looking for the chemical that, that makes pee smell, and we look for things that can mix well with uh, the the gaseous phase. Uh, and so that, I'm gonna ammonia is uh, is one thing that can, and that is what gives pee its kind of like characteristic smell. Um, so it, it's small; it only has four atoms, which means it can mix well with the uh, with the air and then go easily into your nose. Um, and so only tiny amounts of this stuff are present in fresh urine, but um, our nose is super, super, super sensitive, uh, so it can detect, you know, just like a, a few molecules. Um, and so this is also key to why, you know, why your urine smells, oh, too much beer here, uh, why your urine smells a, a, a little bit differently from day to day, maybe, is different amounts of ammonia, or different amounts of other, like, volatile chemicals, chemicals that can easily, you know, escape the pee and go into your nose. And also is the difference for different species. They just have small, tiny differences in the amount of like uh, chemicals that can escape the pee, and that's why they smell so different. What, what if you pee in bleach? What if you you pee in bleach? That yes, that would be bad. That, that um, it, it either you know I've been meaning to figure this out. It either releases uh, nitric oxide or chlorine gas. I'm not sure which one happens, but you know you should never yeah mix. But there's actually only a tiny amount of like ammonia is only like like 0.5% or something of urine, but it might kill you, so don't do it, but, yeah. good question. But it might not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it could generate hydrazine also, so yes, watch out. Hydrazine is bad as well. So, so old pee smells worse than new pee because of this ammonia stuff, so there's uh, pee contains urea, and there's bacteria um, that, that migrate towards the pee, and then we'll um, uh, turn the urea into more ammonia. So old pee has more ammonia, which is why it smells so much more gross if anyone of you have ever tried this. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? When should we be throwing our old pee? Should, I mean, usually immediately, unless you want to do a, a control, a safety, safely controlled experiment, you should throw your pee out. Why are dogs so uh, lots of animals, so why are dogs interested in smelling pee? So lots of animals use uh, pee for, uh, for an insane variety of like uh, things, and I don't, I don't know why dogs do it, but it's, it's again, comes down to like the, they're smelling the, like the volatiles, the tiny amount of volatiles in the, in the pee. Yeah, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, so that brings us to factor number number two. Pee contains both urea and ammonia, which are both sources of nitrogen. So. Remember that for the end of the talk? So we've had all these questions about P, and we've just received all these answers about P, and this is thank, thanks to the, you know, the hundreds of people that, go, that came before us who investigated, actually did research on P. So people, you know, hundreds of years ago, look out at the world and, and are like, you know, what, what is going on here? What is the world made of, right? And so they, uh, they come up with some like relatively like crazy theories, uh, but they were maybe starting to get there, but eventually they you know, developed the scientific method and started doing experiments. And when you do experiments, you need something to experiment on. And so, what is one of the first things that people did experiments on? Can anyone take a guess? P. P. Yes, that is right, P. So, a lot of the first, uh, like chemistry and the, like a lot of alchemy was done on P initially, so we're gonna describe, uh, uh, they were trying to, yes, they tried to, ice, uh, they tried to isolate the philosopher's stone from P, which would turn anything into gold, it, you know, so, yeah. Um, so the, one of the, I'll go through a few experiments here. One of the, this is cutting edge, edge chemistry in 1669. They take a bucket of P, and then they let it age until it gets warm. This is from the, like, paper. This is from the experimental section of the paper. Until the pea, the pea is ready when it gets warms. And then they do, this, they do this other crazy thing that I'll describe in a second, and they get phosphorus from it, which is the first time anyone had seen phosphorus. And this is um, phosphorus chemiluminescing. It's not, that's where the word phosphorescence comes from phosphorus, but it's not actually phosphorescence. It's chemiluminescence, which is when the phosphorus is reacting with oxygen in the atmosphere, and that reaction creates light. Um, and so they started out with 121 gallons of pee <laughs> and ended up with one gram of phosphorus, which is about the amount of a paper clip. So this was, this was a humongous deal back in the day, even with just you know 100 grams. And this is the, um, 
a, an artist depiction of the dude Henning Brand discovering it. Here's the phosphorus glowing um, right there, and he's probably having his mind blown because it's, it's glowing, and it's, you know, I mean, you don't see many things glow except for, like, logs on a fire back in 1669. So, um, yeah, so, what, so what's going on here? So what this setup that he was, like, kneeling in front of is, uh, so he took pea syrup, which is the, the 121 gallons, he boils off all of the water, you end up with a pea syrup, right? And he mixed that, he mixed that with sand, put it inside this thing called a retort, um, and you've probably seen maybe maybe things like this. Uh, and so, actually, so, and then he hooks this stuff up to a collection flask, which is what you see right there, uh, which is where the, the, the phosphorus comes, and the retort is inside there having the crap heated out of it. So that is the, the ex extra part here, is you need to heat the crap out of this to make it happen. Um, and when you do it under these conditions, uh, there's very little oxygen around, and so the, the organic molecules in your pee end up getting turned into pretty much charcoal, into, into carbon. And the carbon is able to steal the oxygen atoms from the, the phosphates that are in your pee. Uh, this, is a, this is a phosphate. Um, and it's able to steal those oxygen atoms, make carbon monoxide, all sorts of other crazy stuff happens, and you get phosphorus at the end. So, factor number number two, P contains phosphates. Question. Why did he, why did he mix the syrup with sand? That, uh, who, I, I, yeah, I have no idea. Why did he mix the syrup with sand was the question, and who knows? I mean, why, yeah, that's. Yeah. Can you use this process to make glow sticks? You, so, this is the, so, this is the, when phosphorus glows, it's the same exact kind of, same exact phenomenon as, as glow sticks. So you, uh, you could use, uh, phosphorus to make glow sticks. Um, if you like expose the, the phosphorus to oxygen, it would glow in the, a similar manner. The, the bad part of it is that this stuff is, was like, when it was made was the most toxic substance that had ever been made <laughs> in the history of like, the world. And so it kill, went on to kill a, a lot of the people who were working with it. It was used in a lot of warfare and stuff and all this like bad stuff, super duper toxic. So was anybody burned for it? what's that? Burned. What? How do you mean? Was anybody burned for it? How do you mean? At, at the stake? I don't believe. I don't. I don't believe so. But that's. I, who knows? Yeah. The world is a crazy place. So how do you get 120 gallons of pee? You. They actually. So how do you get 120 gallons of pee? Was the question. Yeah, urine is so and hard to come by. They, so there were. I, they. Um. I believe isolated it from uh, like uh, horses and cows and stuff like that as well as well as people. So I've seen definitely references to like you know we took the horse urine and we boiled it off. So yeah, yeah. How many people do you think take like to make one glow stick? Like how long would it take? <laughs> uh, probably a pretty long time. I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea how long it would take to make one glow stick of phosphorus. Yeah, you'd probably die first. <laughs> so, um, so some more ex ex experiments. This dude, uh, Herman Borhav, whose name I'm butchering, uh, uh, isolated urea from urine. Um, in 1727, and the way he did that, he again starts with buckets of pee. He again boiled off the water, leaving us with a paste, and then he then left that paste for an entire year. Uh, and then at the end of that year, there was uh, there was um, some like water, some liquid on top, which he discarded, leaving this like weird like solid at the bottom. He rinsed that solid with cold water, and this is like rinsing away the things like sodium chloride and all the things that are water soluble, leaving behind. Uh, urea, which is not that water soluble, and doing a recrystallization, which I'm sure many of you have done in chemistry lab, and it, and um, and that ends up with like uh, urea crystals. And this was a big deal because he had isolated a pure pure matter from the living world, a pure chemical from the living world, and this was a big deal back in the day because people subscribed to the, the notion of vitalism, which was that that uh, living matter can only come from other living matter. So you can't turn rocks into into living matter. And this is different from you can't turn rocks into like a, a live animal. You just the chemicals lived in a separate world in these people's heads. Um, so this was uh, this was helpful to kind of investigate the living world. Um, and so this was true until uh, this dude Friedrich Friedrich Wohler uh, came along and uh, and blew everyone's minds in 1828 and did exactly what nobody thought he could do. Um, and so he was he was a, an inorganic chemist, a rock chemist. Uh, he was trying to take these two uh, salts and just swap the ion. That's all he wanted to do. Um, and he, uh, but instead, what happened is he made urea. And so he'd taken, he'd taken matter from the non-living world and turned it into matter from the living world and blown people's minds. So this, uh, so people, 
um, had to kind of change the way they thought about uh, vitalism and about how they thought about how you know the matter from the living world related to matter from the non-living world, um, and so and I like to and and so um, I like to kind of push this uh, this this thought process a little bit further. Talk about how like our atoms are no so we currently know you know our atoms are no different from the atoms of this this table or or anything else. Uh, you know the, an atom is an atom, and so I like to think of us as uh, as earth particles as little like. Like walking, talking, peeing, little parts of the Earth's crust, you know, um, and so, and so this is where the facts that you have to remember come in. Pee contains water, nitrogen, and phosphorus, and so those things. As we pee, we are helping to cycle all of these things uh, throughout, both among, uh, from living being to living being, as well as, as well as from living being to rock and living being to like ocean, and so this is all kind of connected through these cycles. Um, and so the, one of the one of the most you know well known ones is the water cycle. It's pretty simple. Things evaporate from the ocean, they precipitate here, and they s flow through uh, you know either on top or underneath the ground, and and you know the cycle goes around. And here we are <laughs> drinking the precipitation, peeing out, it flows through. And so this is you know think of this every time you pee. This one's pretty cool. The, uh, another cool um, uh, chemical cycle is the nitrogen cycle. So nitrogen in the atmosphere. Uh, plants need nitrogen. Nitrogen. To survive, but they cannot use this nitrogen from the atmosphere. They have to rely on bacteria in the soil uh, that do something called nitrogen fixation. They turn it into ammonium, and plants can use that, and then other bacteria can turn it into nitrates. So plants use these two things. They are assimilated into the plants. We eat the plants, and we either die or pee or whatever, and it goes back to uh, back to ammonium. And these uh, other bacteria can turn the nitrates into nitrogen, in the, and the cycle is completed. And so here. Here we are doing our eating and peeing and participating, and we've also put this whole other crazy one in where we are taking nitrogen from the atmosphere and fixing it, uh, doing nitrogen fixation. And we do this now on the on the on the, on the scale of all the bacteria on all the planet. We do, and it takes up one percent of the energy of all the world to do this part. And the consequences are unclear. So that's my environmentalist uh, thing uh, for us. So then, and the coolest cycle I would say is the phosphorus cycle. So. The, the phosphorus cycle starts with just you know erosion from from mountains and stuff, and then it goes. The phosphate eventually ends up in the soil, and it's assimilated by by plants, and then animals eat the plants, and it kind of goes around in the, in this cycle here for a while. Eventually, it kind of gets into the ocean and can go around in that cycle for a while. Eventually, the phosphate falls to the bottom of the ocean and sits there in the sediment. And you might be saying to yourself, well, this is not much of a cycle. Right, it's, it's at the bottom of the ocean now. And so the phosphorus cycle is cool because it has to go through the earth. And so once the bottom of the ocean becomes the top of the mountains, then the phosphorus cycle is complete. You know, so it's a really, really, really slow cycle. And um, so here we are, we are, uh, we are mining phosphorus from, uh, from uh, geological deposits. And we are also, you know, playing the part of the animal again, uh, doing our peeing. And that's how the phosphorus goes around. So. Remember, remember this. Next time you pee, you know you're you are you are part of the world, and you're part you you are part of all the the biosphere and all that stuff. So, yeah. And so this this is all I've got time to, to talk about tonight. But I've got many more pee thoughts and many more non pee thoughts on my blog, Science Minus Details. If you'd like to check them out, thank you very much. I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Question in the back. Do you know if asparagus pee is distinctive or not? I, I do, and I took the slide. I have, so what it, asparagus contains this this molecule uh, called asparagusic acid, and it has sulfur in uh, sulfur in it. And so we eat that, and we um, digest it into these smaller sulfur sulfur pieces. And uh, um, the the smaller sulfur pieces could very easily escape the pee and go into our mouths. And for some reason, that is very, into our mouths, into our nose. And for some reason, that's very unclear to me. Most chemicals that contain sulfur smell awful. It's like like rotten eggs, uh, um, far, farts, you know, these things are all related to sulfur molecules. So that's, that is what gives asparagus pee its smell. And if you don't know what we're talking about, it might mean that you have a, um, a genetic mutation that does not allow you to to smell the, the these chemicals, which is so. And there's also differences in the, in the amounts that people make them. So, yeah. But that's actually that's that's on the blog. So check it out. Yes. So if pea contains all of this nitrogen and phosphorus, why does peeing on your lawn kill it in various interesting patterns? 
I, so the question is, why does peeing on your lawn kill it in interesting patterns if it contains all these things that are that are necessary for life? And I, that is an experiment I have not done, so I have no, I have no idea. Yeah, it might be. I don't know. I could only postulate. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Is pee an acid or a base? <laughs> pee is pee is overall basic because of the because of the ammonia. Ammonia is a base. I worked at a garden store. You could feed something to your basically you could feed to your dogs to make their pee then more acidic. So that it wouldn't kill your lawn. So I think it might be really? something about that, yes. So pee kills your lawn because of the acidity, because of the basicity of pee, I apparently. Believe that's that's true. all right. So yes. <laughs> this is this is awesome. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Do you know if just like isolated urea smell? Yeah, isolated urea does not smell. Huh. Yeah, pretty wild. It's yeah. it's like very it um yeah, it's like a pretty um, though it is a small molecule, it does it has properties that make it like a solid, and so it, yeah, it stays. Because urea is the, the actual waste, right? Urea is a, the primary way that we get rid of nitrogen, yeah. So it's most most of the nitrogen in our pee is urea, not ammonia. So ammonia has been there in very small amounts. Yeah. Question. Is it true that if you're like dying of thirst, that's all of a sudden it shouldn't be alive? That you're supposed to drink your own pee? Like, does that save your life? That, I th so that can get you for like, Eventually, that will kill you. Yeah, because these things, your body does want to get rid of. There are there are like um, um, like various salts and things in there, and that can uh, that can eventually, you know, drinking salt water will will actually dehydrate you. So it'll actually do the. So I think it's probably not bad for you once or twice, but eventually it would kill you. Yes. Question in the way back. That I, I have does pee on peeing on a jellyfish burn really work? I do not, I do not know. It probably if so if a jellyfish burn is due to some sort of chemical in your you know in the um, it, that has, it is deposited on your foot, then I imagine pee is probably a better solvent than, than normal water because it's got all this other stuff in it that can maybe wash something away. But I, I really have no idea. Yeah, that's a guess. So one more way back. So actually, pee in the swimming pool. This is an active area of research of like. Uh, so yes, what concentration of swim of pee can you actually get in the swimming pool? And so there are things in um, you know, they, they put the, the the chlorine or whatever in the um, swimming pool to to break things down like this. And there are people who do research on like kind of what are the breakdown products of uh, urea reacting with these like uh, these like chlorine things. And so. Yeah, they, they, pee breaks down in a pool fairly quickly anyway to, to other things. And, and so the area of research is like, are those other things bad for you? So, yeah, pretty, yeah, you can't get it very high. So don't drink pool water. Don't drink, well, yes, don't drink pool water. Yeah. All right. Cool, all right, thank you very much.